And our topic for today is breast cancer survivorship for the primary, primary care provider. Our speakers uh, include myself, Jane Pret. I'm a breast surgeon up at Huntsman, uh, Dr. Phoebe Freer, who's a breast radiologist, and Anna Beck, uh, medical oncologist, and Yuta Deininger, who's an oncology nurse practitioner. Just to start off with, I wanted to kind of talk about what actually is a breast cancer survivor. So we think of a survivor as someone who's lived through something, um, but it really is uh, patients who have been diagnosed with cancer, who've lived with, through, and beyond cancer. So survivorship really begins at diagnosis and extends through the treatment and through the rest of uh, breast cancer survivor's life. Looking at breast cancer statistics really tells us kind of how many survivors there are and the impact of this disease, uh, even in primary care practices. So as many of you may know, about 12.4% of women in the United States will be diagnosed with breast cancer in her lifetime. And women do live with this disease. In fact, five-year survival rate for women diagnosed with non-metastatic breast cancer is 91%. And currently there are more than 3.8 million women living who have been diagnosed with breast cancer in the US. So it's this population of women that we're talking about today, a significant number. So there are several issues for breast cancer survivors. One of the main concerns is what is the risk of for of recurrence. So most breast cancer patients ask that question once they're diagnosed with the disease is what are the chances it's going to come back? And then of course the concern about what is the follow-up plan after treatment? And then the lasting side effects of treatment, what are some ongoing long-term therapies? And then finally physical, emotional, lifestyle changes that occur because of this diagnosis and treatment. So as a breast cancer surgeon, I'm going to talk mostly about some of the physical things, risk of recurrence and clinical follow-up. Uh, Dr. Freer is gonna talk about our imaging follow-up and then some of the other issues uh, pertain to medical oncology follow-up and long-term therapies, Dr. Beck and Yuta Deininger will address. So when we talk about breast cancer recurrence, uh, unfortunately we don't have really robust data on recurrence from uh, large databases. When we look at breast cancer statistics, um, we follow the SEER data, which is the surveillance epidemiology and end results data. So we mostly look at breast cancer survival. This table here lists the survival rates for all comers with breast cancer. And it's divided into patients who have localized disease, regional and distant. Regional is disease that's in the breast and lymph nodes. And you can see we have fairly high survival rates when we look, take breast cancer patients, all comers. 90% five-year survival rate for our patients. When we look at a more aggressive form of breast cancer, and this is the triple negative breast cancer patients, the five-year survival rates are much less. This type of cancer is the cancer that has negative estrogen receptors and negative for HER2. So the estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, and HER2 proteins are three things we look at when we're managing and trying to treat breast cancer patients. So this type of breast cancer you can see has a poor prognosis when distance spread is found. So what are some of the risk factors for recurrence? When patients present with lymph node involvement, the risk of recurrence either local or distant is higher. Patients that present with larger tumor sizes, younger patients, patients who have an aggressive form of breast cancer called inflammatory breast cancer, and patients, as I just showed you, that have triple negative breast cancer also are noted to have higher risk of breast cancer recurrence. Obesity is also associated with increased recurrence and poorer outcomes, particularly in our postmenopausal women. And women also have a higher risk for recurrence if they don't comply with original treatment recommendations or don't complete treatment. This study that was published in New England Journal of Medicine gave us a bit more insight into what the long-term risk of recurrence is in estrogen receptor positive uh, breast cancer patients. 
This study was published in 2017. And in this study, they looked at uh, 88 different studies, which compiled over 62,000 patients who had completed treatment for estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. What this study found was that even the very earliest, this is the low stage, small tumors, negative nodes, had a risk of recurrence at 20 years that approached 13%. There was a steady risk of recurrence for all breast cancers throughout the following 20 years after treatment. So this just shows us that all breast cancer survivors do have a risk of recurrence, some of course lower than others, but we need to be mindful both at the oncology level and the primary care level of monitoring these patients appropriately. So what is the follow-up for breast cancer patients? Our guidelines recommend a follow-up visit with a clinical breast exam one to four times yearly for five years and then annually. Why is it so variable at one to four times yearly? Well, this is really based upon the patient's risk. So our low risk estrogen receptor positive, no negative patients may have longer interval follow-ups and our more high risk patients we're gonna be seeing more closely. Imaging, Dr. Furrier is gonna talk about how we do yearly mammograms. And then at these follow-up visits, we're also gonna to wanna to review for new symptoms, changes in their risk profile. This includes genetic changes in their family. And then of course, discussing with these patients treatment related problems and side effects. This busy slide is just our reference that we use the National Comprehensive Cancer Network or the NCCN guidelines to guide most of our treatment and follow-up in oncology. You can see what the recommendations are here for the exam is the history and physical exam one to four times yearly is clinically appropriate for five years and then annually. Genetic screening. Okay. Uh, and then we also monitor our patients for lymphedema. The other items listed here, I'm gonna leave up to our additional presenters. So looking at what are some of the physical exam signs of concern when we're following our breast cancer patients, certainly a lump or thickening in the breast, a change in the shape or contour of the breast, also change in the look or feel of the skin of the breast, nipple discharge and nipple changes are all things that we look for. I'm gonna give you a few example patients and these are all patients who I'm actually currently treating for breast cancer recurrences. This patient, patient A, was uh, she is a 64-year-old female. She was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2011. She was 55 years old at the time of diagnosis, and she underwent a lumpectomy and a sentinel lymph node biopsy. The pathology of this cancer was a one centimeter tumor, negative nodes, estrogen receptor positive, HER2 negative. So this is one of our very low risk breast cancers. However, she declined additional treatment and should have had radiation and endocrine therapy. In 2020, just recently, she palpated a new small lump near her prior lumpectomy scar. So this felt like a small BB. And this is what we see on ultrasound. See, there's just this very tiny nodule that measures less than a centimeter, but this was palpable to the patient overlying her implant. So this was one thing that we look for when we're monitoring patients for recurrent breast cancer, just any small nodules in the area of their previous disease. These are just some pictures of normal lumpectomy patients. So this patient, you can see has a good outcome, a small scar, she doesn't have a lot of changes. This patient had a lot of radiation fibrosis. You can see how one breast is smaller than the other due to both the volume removed at surgery and the radiation changes. This patient had a cancer in a difficult place in the lower breast where sometimes we see more retraction. All of these patients have normal post lumpectomy changes and no sign of recurrence. This is another patient that has a little bit of edema from radiation, her scar up here, but also these are normal changes from lumpectomy. This next patient I'm gonna show you has some extreme changes, uh, but just as a point of some things to look for. So this patient is 86 year old female. She was treated for breast cancer 23 years ago in 1997 with a lumpectomy, axillary dissection, chemotherapy, radiation, five years of tamoxifen. She'd been doing well, but palpated a mass and some progressing changes in her right breast in the area of prior cancer. 
This is a picture of her, and certainly this is not a normal breast, but what a lot of women think is that their scar tissue is progressing. Usually scar tissue doesn't really progress over time. So anyone who has a changing scar, palpable thickening, lump, nipple changes is a sign of current occurrence. And these are her imaging studies. You can see she's developed quite a large tumor that's a recurrent cancer in the breast. Finally, an 85-year-old female who was treated for breast cancer in 2001, then ultimately had a recurrence that was an inflammatory cancer, a very aggressive cancer in 2018, treated with chemotherapy, declined surgery at that time and then presented in 2020 with some new skin nodules. So these are signs of recurrent breast cancer. Uh, if you're not familiar with breast cancer and don't see a lot of these changes, you might not recognize this as something that is a sign of recurrence. But in our breast cancer patients, this is one of the findings that we look out for. So I'm gonna conclude at that point uh, and pass it on to Dr. Freer, who's gonna talk about imaging for surveillance. Hi, this is Phoebe Freer, and I am the Section Chief of Breast Imaging uh, with the Department of Radiology for UU Health and for Huntsman. Um, and we'll talk a bit about imaging surveillance of breast cancer survivors. So in, we're gonna hit the conclusion first and then we'll kind of go through what the whys. Um, basically a patient with a prior personal history of breast cancer, uh, you wanna do annual mammogram. You can actually order it as a screening or a diagnostic from a medical standpoint. At Huntsman, we do recommend a diagnostic for the first five years, but we'll go through that. Um, we also recommend an MRI in women who were diagnosed with a personal history of breast cancer under the age of 50. Um, for ultrasound, we do not do screening ultrasound. We don't offer it in general, um, and we do not recommend it for women with a prior personal history of breast cancer. However, if a woman should be getting an MRI and cannot tolerate it, um, then screening MRI would be appropriate. Otherwise, it's uh, used for um, targeted symptoms if the patient's complaining of an area or a clinician feels something, um, or if a patient has had a mastectomy and has clinical symptoms, because then they can't get a mammogram. Um, women who have undergone a mastectomy of the affected breast um, do not need screening imaging of the affected breast of any sort. So if they've had bilateral mastectomies because of either prophylaxis or something else, they do not need any um, follow-up imaging and it, the imaging is uh, um, reserved only for people who have clinical symptoms. If the patient's had a unilateral mastectomy, then they get an annual mammogram on the other side. So screening versus diagnostic, what is the difference? Um, it comes down to one, if a patient's symptomatic or if the, we are actually following an imaging finding, we always order a diagnostic. Uh, screening is contraindicated in those cases um, and we'll usually change it at the appointment. If they're at a site where we don't do diags, we'll reschedule them if they were screened, if they were scheduled inappropriately. Um, for lumpectomy follow-ups, the patients usually aren't symptomatic, right? They're usually asymptomatic and they're just coming in for follow-up. So do they actually need a diagnostic? Um, what's the difference? The answer is no, they don't actually need a diagnostic. Um, there's no difference in the images obtained. So this was a question even from one of our um, top multidisciplinary referrers um, when they were first starting uh, out of fellowship. And they thought we did something special or magical on our diagnostic imaging that we didn't do on the screening. I would love to say that we did that, but we don't. It's the exact same type of images. So if the patient's due for an annual mammogram, when they show up for a diagnostic annual, it's the same thing. They're getting a CC and an MLO, the cranial caudal and the medial lateral look like of both breasts um, or whatever breast is due for screening. Um, in the exact same way, exact same thing, we don't use any special um, technique or anything like that that they do for screening. What the diagnostic appointment allows us to do, however, is any additional imaging if it's needed without calling the patient back. So we can do magnification images if we're following an area uh, questioning of calcifications. We can do spot compression if we see something, if we can't tell if something is a scar or not a scar or any other special views. Um, and then we can also add on an ultrasound. So this is a diagnostic mammo. It looks just like a screening mammo. The CC is the right, um, the right breast and the left breast over here. You see a scar marker here. Um, this patient actually had a symptom. So we marked that here with a triangle. We now usually mark it with a BB. 
um, but she actually had a symptom, so she came in. However, otherwise, this is the exact same images that she has done, even with a symptom, um, minus here we put a, a, this marker on. Um, we don't usually use scar markers. Um, occasionally, we do if we can't tell. This was put on to say, was this correlating with the patient's scar um, because she was feeling something, and so was she just feeling her scar? But you can see standard CC and MLOs. Um, the MQSA, our federal requirements for mammography, right? We are, we are one of the few things that's fully evidence-based and we are required to audit our results. We actually have, I can tell you every radiologist how good we are because I'm lead interpreting physician and I have to submit it every year to the FDA or to the ACR. Um, we actually have to track our results um, and, and what we do in addition to many other um, federal awesome. guidelines. One awesome. of those guidelines is that takes <laughs> the patient's book for diagnostic imaging, we have to give the results to the patient at the time of the imaging. Therefore, a diagnostic is helpful for women who have had a prior personal history of breast cancer because they get read and get their results before they leave us. So they know whether or not they're normal. And you can imagine the psychological benefits of that. That said, there are lots of people who argue that the psychological benefits would be greater if you actually just told a patient she's normal and she doesn't have to do anything extra, that might be increasingly reassuring for a patient. And so there's some movements now um, to say, you know, do these patients really need diagnostic? Can they just get screened? At Huntsman and all the U sites, um, the ones that are done at Huntsman or at South Jordan or Farmington when a doctor is scheduled, uh, when a radiologist is actually out there, those patients are almost all read the same day if the patient's willing to wait. And therefore we can do any additional imaging and change it to a diagnostic if needed to be or add on a diagnostic um, if, um, if we had to. Um, that said, we recommend as a multidisciplinary group that the patients are scheduled for the diagnostic mammogram for five years after treatment. Um, and the question would be, well, why wouldn't you just do that? Like why go through, could we do screening? It comes down to money, right? So there's no medical reason to do a diagnostic instead of a screening. Um, we do recommend that you do it. It makes it easier for our standpoint. It, patients are usually scheduled the same day they have a clinical post follow-up um, with either the surgeon or the oncologist. It lets us align their appointments nicely. They get their results right then. Um, but screening is a free preventive public health service. It's been um, uh, regularly voted by Congress to continue to be, even with USPSTF guidelines. So we should be able to keep it that way. Whereas a diagnostic often requires a patient a copay or a cost towards the deductible. Some of the patients have super high deductible plans. They might be being billed 1,000 to 1,500 bucks on a, on a um, high deductible plan for their diagnostic. So if you have a patient who really balks at having to do a diagnostic and really wants a screening, that's fine. You can reassure them that it's fine. We prefer a diag, but it is okay. Um, and we would suggest that you schedule it, still get it scheduled at the same time as their clinical appointment um, so that they can have it at the same uh, time that they have it done at one of the diagnostic sites on a diagnostic day where a radiologist is staffed and then um, just to have them read it the same day. But from a financial standpoint, we have had a few patients requesting that. So screening versus diagnostic, however, does not negate the fact that there might be good arguments for more intensive screening of the women who've had a prior personal history um, because they're at increased risk of developing a new cancer. So is it worthwhile to do six month mammograms or potentially instead we do um, an MRI at a six month interval alternating with the mammograms so that the six month is every year, the mammograms every year, but that they're staggered six months from each other. Historically, women after a prior personal history of breast cancer were recommended for a um, post lumpectomy follow-up within six months. Um, studies now show this is not useful. So this is not required. Um, we are able to tell what the scar looks like eventually uh, at the annual follow-up. Um, recurrence rates, um, as Jane was just mentioning, are approximately one to 2% per year um, at, at worst. And really they're probably about half that. Um, and most patients do not recur if they were properly treated in the beginning. So the only time we would do a six month follow-up post-surgery would be if the patient did not have standard treatment. If the patient declined, say radiation or declined having, um, going back in for um, negative margins, if they uh, were not taking any of the, of the uh, recommended treatment, then potentially a six month follow-up is recommended. But in one study published in 2013 from McNall and all at the, um, McNall et al at Journal of Surgical Oncology, uh, looking at about 400 patients who were screened, um, had, who had a lumpectomy um, between 1997 and 2009, they had greater than two years of follow-up. 
on the first two years of follow-up, there were near no recurrences and there were no differences whatsoever in the group that had six month follow-up versus the one year follow-up. So um, it does not make a difference in the first two years post lumpectomy. Here is a patient, however, who you can see, um, you can see one mammogram that was done at a six month post lumpectomy and it looks fine. This is just her scar. This is the patient we looked at before. You can see her scar tissue there. At her annual, however, you can see denser tissue. So you can see a change and we were able to detect a recurrence at that time, um, detected nothing at six months because she probably didn't have a recurrence at that time, um, but did have one at the uh, um, 11 months. She is an early recurrence. She is extraordinarily unusual. Usually those are pretty fulminant recurrences um, and she ends up uh, being one of those as well. So this is one of the, the rare cases who does recur in the first two years um, screening earlier does not actually help both in data and that anecdote. But what about the after the first one to two years, then would it? Well, we know from mammogram uh, modeling alone, just for screening, that the more frequently we screen, the more deaths that can be averted. If you think to regular screening guidelines, we recommend at Huntsman um, as a multidisciplinary group that all patients, regardless of risk, all women, female patients are screened 40 and up every year. We know that saves the most lives, um, both in models and in real data. Um, that more lives are saved with annual screening over, um, over screening every two years. What if you screen more often? So models from Michelson and Copans et al. suggest that even in average risk women, the more often we screen, the more deaths can be averted. Now, obviously this comes on downsides. We're not gonna talk too much about the downsides. Um, it's namely, um, extra radiation, increased appointments for the patient, and then questionably overdiagnosis. However, overdiagnosis does not actually, is not affected by how often we screened. If the cancer's there for us to see, we're gonna see it whenever they come. We're not gonna diagnose it more often just because they were screened more often. Um, but models suggest that yes, indeed, we do avert more deaths if we screen more often. Um, so of course, in women with a prior personal history, that's true. So one study from UCSF looked at um, uh, over 2000 women uh, about 90% of those women after lumpectomy had a six month follow up, and um, about 10% weren't compliant with the six month follow up and had annual mammograms. Of those, um, they detected um, 94 recurrences in the group that had uh, Q six months uh, mammogram. They found 15 recurrences in the group that had annual. Um, of the abnormalities, they found the majority were cancers, which is interesting. So the false positive rate is not that high. Um, the cancers that were found by mammograms that were done twice a year were more likely to be stage zero or stage one. Those are early cancers. They were smaller in size. You can see about two thirds of the size and they were more likely to be node negative. All of those are p-value significance. And that's pretty interesting because it shows that after you get past the two year stage, potentially screening every six months might actually help you find more early treatable cancers. So why don't we recommend this? And the real question comes down to, um, so sorry, I didn't look, I, Skip this slide. We, they didn't look at, um, at long-term uh, treatment outcomes, so we don't know that there is a survival benefit. But why do we not recommend two six-month mammograms after two years? Well, we know that mammograms are imperfect, especially in dense breasts, especially in women who are high risk, which are women with a prior personal history of breast cancer. Sometimes the rates are as low as between 10 and 30%. So can we do better? And the answer is yes. Now we have the MRI. So the sensitivity for cancer detection with MRI in the, one of the first studies that looked at women with a prior personal history was 85% versus 23% for mammography. So should we consider supplemental screening MRI? And the question is yes. So all women who meet a 20% um, or greater lifetime risk of breast cancer have been recommended since 2007 for having screening MRI added to their annual mammogram. It's not a replacement, it's an adjunct. And we know this, this is the 2007 SASLO et al guidelines. So these are the BRCA patients, the patients with a strong family history, et cetera. So anyone who's greater than 20% lifetime risk gets screened regardless of whether or not they have a prior personal history. That said, if you risk stratify women, almost all women who were diagnosed less than 50 with a prior, with a history of breast cancer, especially if they have dense breasts, end up having a risk stratification greater than 20%. So consider MRI in those women. Um, also consider adjunctive screening if, even if the risk stratification isn't um, high enough, if the um, cancer was mammographically occult to, to begin with. 
Um, if I couldn't see it as a radiologist to begin with, how am I going to see it on that recurrence? If I were that woman, I would say, hey, please give me more. So consider MRIs in those cases. Consider lobular cancers usually because of risk stratification. Extremely dense breasts, again, because of the masking phenomenon. And then if there was much more extensive disease than was seen initially, those are usually the lobular cancers as well, and then the extremely dense breasts. So all those kind of overlap with one another. But strongly consider uh, adjunctive MRI in those groups. Why? So women with a prior personal history and some of the early studies that were done, the cancer detection rate was as high as 10 and a half per thousand. Now, if you think back on MAMO, um, many of you may know this, many of you may not, MAMO cancer detection rates on a baseline mammogram are about four to six per thousand. Um, on follow-up mammograms in the average population, it's about two to four per thousand. So if the MRI sensitivity is literally fourfold that of mammogram, and the cancer detection rate is fourfold that of mammogram. It's really strongly um, consider a supplemental MRI. Newer studies show even higher cancer detection rate, consistently above 10, all the way up to 30 per thousand. So really remarkable stuff. Here's a patient who ha had a um, MRI detected incidental DCIS. You see this um, uh, non-mass enhancement going towards the nipple in a lineal seg linear segmental pattern. Um, this is a recurrence in this patient. Um, here's a patient who had a negative screening mammogram and she had it literally the same day as her MRI. And even knowing where her cancer is, I can tell you, I cannot see it. It is mammographically occult and it's because it's in one of the uh, places that hides on a mammogram. Um, here she is, um, uh, with this large subareolar mass about two and a half centimeters. So MRI really does make a huge difference. And Society of uh, Breast Imaging and the American College of Radiology have published in the Journal of uh, American College of Radiology in 2018 that MRI is beneficial if diagnosed before age 65. Um, if the woman's diagnosed before age 65, it's very beneficial. And you should especially consider it if the woman was diagnosed before age 50. Um, if those women have dense breasts, more reason to strongly consider it. Um, there's one multi-institutional study that looked at close to 800 women that showed that the MRI actually decreases the interval cancers in women compared to just annual mammography, and it improved the detection of the um, biologically aggressive tumor. So that's a huge difference. Do you need ultrasound? The answer is no. Sorry, I still have somehow made a mess on my slide here. Um, but the answer is no. Ultrasound is not going to add anything to supplemental screening MRI if you're doing it. You would only consider it if, let's say, the patient had a cardiac pacemaker or a gadolinium anaphylactic injury. Uh, um, allergy, those are extraordinarily rare um, for the gadolinium allergies, um, but if the patient really required MR and couldn't have it, and most younger women don't have that. So in summary, just to repeat, we do recommend annual mammogram. Huntsman team recommends diagnostic for the first five years. If your patient really balks at that, you can order a screen. It's medically okay. Um, just put it in the notes why. Um, the MRI um, is, would be recommended for women who were diagnosed with breast cancer under the age of 50 or those with um, the cancer that was occult or extremely dense breasts. Um, ultrasounds only needed for targeted symptoms. Um, and women who have undergone prophylactic mastectomy do not require imaging. I did not go through, do we image the affected breasts? I mean, the reconstructed breasts, such as if the patient had a, um, a tram. Uh, or a flap reconstruction. So we can't really implant, a, uh, we can't mammogram an implant with a, um, I'm sorry, we can't mammogram a mastectomy with an implant reconstruction. However, we can do a tram reconstruction or other deep flaps. Um, it's not recommended because studies have looked at it and show that it's not very beneficial, but it is fine if the patient is symptomatic, it is safe to do a mammogram on those women. And there are some surgeons, none at our institution, but some around the country who have had some luck finding uh, screen detected cancers on those and will recommend them. But currently at Huntsman, we do not recommend that the um, mastectomy side get screened at all. So any questions, please feel free to chat or email me at Phoebe Freer or just uh, uh, pop me a phone call. So thank you. I will turn the tables now. I think it's over to Yuda. Anna is going to go next, I believe. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Are you able to hop in and share, Anna? No, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. One second. Let me try to fix that again. Jared, you're cutting me out here. <clears throat> if only you were more trustworthy. No, you you have uh, you have two user profiles on here, so. So you need to get one of them as a backup. Should I get rid of it? Yeah. Nope, you're you're good to go now. 
No, oh, okay, there we go. Oops. That's, or you guys aren't seeing the right screen, are you? Yeah, you're sharing, but we don't see that you're sharing anything. There, there we go. That looks good. Does that look good? Uh -huh. Okay, so uh, thank you, everybody. So I'm Anna Beck. I'm one of the medical oncologists up at Huntsman. And uh, Yuta Deininger and I are going to be sharing a talk regarding uh, follow-up of the breast cancer patient. Yuta is going to talk about stuff below the belt, so to speak, and I'm going to talk more about stuff above the belt, if you will. So uh, things that I want to address specifically today, because we have a limited amount of time, is just I want to briefly review what tests are important, what, what, what the guidelines recommend we order whenever we see a patient in follow-up. I want to just review some lymphedema myths, talk about some of the lifestyle recommendations. I think most breast cancer patients always have questions about what diets are most appropriate. And then I wanna spend a little time on medication compliance. So what should we order every time you see a breast cancer patient and follow up? And the answer is surprisingly little. Um, these, there actually has been uh, data that has looked at this. Now I'm old enough where when I first started practicing, every breast cancer patient got a CBC with a diff, a complete metabolic profile, or what was the equivalent of that back then. They also had a chest x-ray, a bone scan, and a CAT scan of the abdomen and pelvis every single year. And what we found over time is that in asymptomatic patients, you're not picking up anything that is of significance 98% of the time. The 2% of the time that you do detect a recurrence earlier, women were not cured or survived any longer because of the early detection. So the recommendations now, based on all of that data, is that we don't do routine blood tests like a blood count or automatic chemistries, and we don't do routine imaging for surveillance. So Women should not be getting PET scans, which are actually a, a lot of radiation exposure. They don't need computed uh, tomography of their chest, abdomen, and pelvis, or any other special studies. And they also don't need tumor markers. These are notoriously unhelpful and not uh, accurate. So, um, so the guidelines really are, you see your patient and you talk with them about lifestyle um, uh, changes, you reduce symptoms, and if they have symptoms, then you definitely want to work them up. But in an asymptomatic patient who has a normal exam, they don't need any specific testing. So I think that's worth bringing up. So let me just review uh, some lymphedema myths. Uh, one of them is that breast cancer patients should never have blood drawn from their affected arm. We now know that you shouldn't do that um, in the first six months or so. Um, but after six months, um, it, as long as it's done under sterile technique, um, it's okay for patients to have a vena peg puncture done from their affected arm, if absolutely necessary. Obviously, if the other arm is uh, readily available and not a problem, that should be the preference. Breast cancer patients should never have blood pressure monitored in their affected arm. And again, this kind of makes sense that it's not that big of a deal. You know, the, the squeeze of a blood pressure cuff on the arm where they've had um, uh, lymph nodes removed is not that significant. So again, the option should be to always go with their contralateral arm, but if necessary, they can have it from their ipsilateral arm. It's not that big of a deal. Um, breast cancer patients should always fly with a compression sleeve. This is an old, um, this is an old myth, and now women don't need to uh, do that anymore. Um, so if you have patients who are flying, it's okay if they um, they don't have to wear a sleeve. And oops, last one. Um, oh, and then the last one is breast cancer patients should not lift weights. And that's also been disproven. Actually, lifting weights has been associated with an improvement in um, the lymphatic flow and helps with the lymphedema. So it's okay to do that as well, too. So let's turn now to lifestyle recommendations. And again, these are, I, I think these are things that breast cancer patients are very interested in. And because you kind of have a captive audience, once they've, once they've been diagnosed with cancer, they're really open to suggestions about what they can do to, to uh, reduce the risk of the cancer coming back. I want to first talk about, you know, what do breast cancer survivors die from? And I'm going to ignore these two columns because they're not as helpful as this column, which are cancer survivors in the first five years after diagnosis, then the first five to 10 years, and then after 10 years of diagnosis. And what you see is that the risk of dying from breast cancer recurrence, which is the heavy blue, 
goes uh, down over time. The risk of new secondary cancers increases over time. That's important to note. Um, the risk of heart disease down here in the light blue increases over time. And curiously enough, the risk for Alzheimer's disease, which is this orangey area, increases over time. And we're not quite sure why that's happening. Um, so that's just something to be aware of. These are things that, you know, at, over time, it's not the breast cancer that has the highest risk of taking their life. It actually turns out to be other causes. Let's talk a little bit about secondary malignancies that happen in breast cancer survivors. This is a very complex graph that was published in JAMA last year about um, using SEER data and looking at secondary malignancies in different types of cancer. And unfortunately, this column, which is the most amount of bright colors in it, representing the highest number of secondary malignancies is the breast cancer survivor uh, row. And that's probably because there are a lot of breast cancer survivors out there. So there's lots of time for them to develop a secondary malignancy. So the ones that they're most likely to get are, are lung cancer, colorectal cancer, stomach cancer. These three cancers, um, uh, and acute leukemia, these are risk or cancers that are more commonly associated with smokers. Um, stomach cancer, pancreatic cancer, uh, uterus and ovarian cancer are also in colorectal cancer. These are associated with obesity as well too. So if you can just focus on those two things with your cancer survivors, um, obesity and smoking risk, you can reduce the risk for secondary malignancies. Another question that you get asked not so often in Utah, but you still get it here, is how much alcohol can I safely drink after the diagnosis of breast cancer? And the answer is we're not quite sure, but we do have some data from the LACE study, Life After Cancer Epidemiology Study. They looked at breast cancer survivors over a number of years, and they quantified them based on how much alcohol they consumed. And basically what they found was anybody who drinks three to four alcoholic drinks per week had an increased risk of recurrence. Now you have to balance that with the fact that there is evidence that women who drink a judicious amount of alcohol, usually one to two glasses per day, can have a reduced risk of dying from cardiovascular disease. So it's always kind of a toss up in terms of what to, to recommend to patients. I usually ask my patients to reduce their drinking to less than three, three drinks or less per week, um, or, at, or, or at least minimize it compared to what they were drinking before their diagnosis. But this is an unanswered question for us. Smoking, it's bad. You know, there's just, I, I don't need to spend a lot of time on this. This particular graph looks again at breast, about 800 breast cancer survivors over time. And this looks at their uh, mortality rate. Those women who are uh, current smokers have a much a significantly higher risk of dying from uh, breast cancer compared to both women who have never smoked or women who stopped smoking. So if you're a smoker and you stop smoking, it makes a difference. So that's, that's the take home message there. About caffeine. Turning to heart disease, this looks at uh, your risk of dying from heart disease, all breast cancer survivors, which is the dotted line, versus women who've never been diagnosed with breast cancer. You can see that women with breast cancer have a higher risk for dying from cardiovascular disease than those who've never been diagnosed. And this is particularly true in the group of women who are over the age of 70. Hmm. And it makes sense because a lot of the risk factors for cardiovascular disease are shared with breast cancer. So women who do a, a follow a Western diet, uh, I mean, here's the alcohol intake is the one that is kind of the outlier there. But diets that are high in red processed meat, women who are largely sedentary, who are overweight in the postmenopausal status who smoke, these are a lot of the shared risk factors. So this makes sense, right? That they have a higher risk for developing heart disease as a survivor. Okay, I'm gonna turn now to diet and supplements, because I get asked this a lot with breast cancer survivors. What should I be eating? How should I change my diet? There is, again, the data regarding how to manage your diet for a breast cancer survivor is always based on um, a kind of retrospective uh, uh, data from breast cancer survivors who are turning in diet um, Yes. Hi, I'm Brooke. I'm a medical student. Hi. Okay, you guys probably need to mute. Hi. Somebody needs to mute out there. A little bit but in any case, okay, okay. sure. All right. Okay. Uh, so, okay. So 
at what we do know from a large number of these studies, the, the NHS and the NH2, which is a nurse's health study, which went over a period of decades, these two, and again, that lay study, is that breast cancer survivors who changed their diet and adopted a healthier diet that's based on complex fiber, uh, coffee, nuts, whole fruits, polyunsaturated fats, had a lower risk of breast cancer recurrence and a lower risk of death. Conversely, those women who continued to have a diet that was high in what we call a Western diet, so red meats, processed meats, refined grains, they had a higher risk of dying from any cause, including breast cancer and cardiovascular disease. So I counsel my patients to try to stay away from red meat, and I remind them that red meat is beef, lamb, and pork. Um, it's not chicken, but pork, even though it used to you know, promote itself as the other white meat, it's not. It's a red meat, so it's best to, to clarify that with your patients. Okay, what supplement should I take? And again, there is a little bit of data from the National Health and Nutrition uh, Survey that happened over a period of 10 years. And what they found from this was that taking supplements does not reduce your mortality from any cause um, for cancer. So this is, this is something that I can't emphasize enough to my patients. I don't recommend that they take any kind of supplements other than vitamin D. And that's because of this data. The NHANES also noted that those people who had an adequate nutritional intake of supplements or uh, uh, nutrients, I should say, and, and vitamins um, had an improved mortality. But that was only the case if they got them from their naturally occurring um, food. So if you eat your carrots and have your spinach and follow a plant-based diet, you don't need supplements. And in fact, there's some data that people who take multivitamins actually have a higher risk of getting cancer. Some of that may be that some of those supplements may cause cancer. That's certainly possible. And we've seen that with prostate cancer and perhaps lung cancer. But it may be also that people tend to take a multivitamin thinking that it makes up for bad dietary habits. So I really try to enforce with my patients that it's important to follow a, a plant-based varied diet. That's the most important thing, not taking a bunch of supplements other than vitamin D, which we need to get from supplements. There's also some data that calcium supplements increase mortality. I'm not a big fan of taking calcium and I don't usually encourage my patients to take it. Uh, let's see. Okay, so what else can you do? There is now uh, plenty of data, and this was from a study that was just published this month in the JNCI, looking at, um, at exercise and the effect that exercise may have on breast cancer re uh, recurrence and mortality. And basically, this is a big study that, that accompanied a, a big uh, national cooperative trial that showed that those women who were following the guidelines for exercise, and the guidelines, if you guys um, are, are not familiar with them. It's 150 minutes of exercise per week. So 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise, which means you can usually talk during the exercise or 75 minutes of intense exercise, which means you can't talk. So you're running or biking uh, hard enough where you can't really talk. I usually just tell them 150 minutes of exercise a week. If you're doing that both before and after your diagnosis of breast cancer and the treatment, that results in a 50% reduction in recurrence. And this data has been confirmed in multiple studies. If exercise was a drug, it would cost $10,000 a month right now, I'm telling you. It is probably one of the most effective things that we can do to reduce our risk for breast cancer recurrence. There's also evidence that if you start exercising after your diagnosis, you still reduce your, your risk of recurrence by at least 20%. And the bottom line is, is that any kind of physical activity that's done on a regular basis can still reduce your risk for breast cancer recurrence and also risk your, reduce your risk from other um, uh, uh, causes of death, such as heart disease. So exercise has lots of data. It's just, it's just a hard thing to um, keep patients dialed in on because it does involve some, some exercise, right? So now I'm gonna, last thing I wanna talk about is medication adherence. Um, a lot of times we have on our hormone receptor positive patients, they're gonna be on anti-estrogen therapy, which is either an aromatase inhibitor of tamoxifen. For higher risk patients, we're now recommending that they do this for 10 years, which is a heavy ask because these drugs do have side effects and there's a large degree of non-compliance. And a lot of times I never see these patients when they stop taking their medicines because they stop coming back to me. But you as a primary care provider may be able to pick up on those patients who uh, no longer wanna take their medicines. 
So for the aromatase inhibitors, a big reason why they stop taking them is because they make them achy. And this achiness for the aromatase inhibitors is a really curious thing and we don't quite understand it. it it's been called the arthritis of menopause because it happens in women who go through menopause as well too. But it's an achiness that may happen in a variety of joints and it can fluctuate in whatever joints it's affecting in a whatever day. So one day your hip may hurt, the next day it may be the base of your thumb, the next day it may be your low back, the next day it may be your knee. So it goes, and then it may be weeks that you don't have any problems and then it comes back and it's terrible. So it's very variable. There have been a lot of things that have been um, documented to be helpful. You know, using an NSAID is helpful. There's been some evidence that for those women who are low in vitamin D, that replacing their vitamin D can reduce the incidence of the achiness. Acupuncture has been shown to be helpful, so is duloxetine and exercise. If it just doesn't get better, oh, another, this is kind of a cheater test, but if you're wondering if the achiness is from the aromatase inhibitor, if you stop it for two or three days and it goes away and you start the drug back up again and it comes back, that's pretty diagnostic. They don't have to stop it for weeks or months. It's usually just a few days and you can tell a difference. If you just can't get the achiness to be tolerable for a woman, sometimes rotating them to another aromatase inhibitor or changing to tamoxifen can um, improve the compliance. The other reason that women stop taking their drugs is hot flashes. And I just wanna post a few uh, drugs that you can think of for women who are struggling with hot flashes. The, the other issue is gonna be vaginal dryness and libido, but I'm gonna let you to talk about that. So these are some of the agents that we use for hot flashes. Um, probably the most common, if they have a lot of hot flashes during the day is gonna be venlafaxine. There's a dose response curve. If you start with a low dose and it only helps a little, Try to increase your dose up to 150 if you can, because the more you give them, it tends to be more effective. Gabapentin is what I use if the hot flashes keep them up at night because it has this nifty side effect of making people sleep. There's also evidence now for oxybutynin, the bladder control drug that also has a very strong activity. It's not a great drug for the elderly because it can cause a lot of uh, problems with constipation. So um, it's one to think about. There are some non-pharmacologic interventions that a lot of women are open to, and that's things like acupuncture, which can be very effective, yoga, and oftentimes I keep, I ask patients to keep diet diaries. I had one patient who said, you know what, I get a hot flash every day at five o'clock. It's like, it's like, it happens like clockwork. And I said, well, you always have a cocktail every day. What time do you have the cocktail? And she says, oh, at five o'clock. And it wasn't until we drew that connection that she realized, well, okay, maybe the hot flashes are caused by our alcohol. Again, just giving women some insight into there may be triggers that are causing those hot flashes. Um, alcohol, chocolate, um, it's a number of things that can do it. Okay, so take home points before I turn it over to Utah. Um, recommending a healthy lifestyle, you know, same risk factors that are associated with breast cancer are associated with a lot of the secondary malignancies that they can get, as well as the cardiovascular disease that they're at increased risk for. For your patients who have asymptomatic or completely asymptomatic, they're in for kind of what I call a well-child visit. They don't need a lot of tests. They don't need any blood work um, unless you want to check a vitamin D level, but they don't need routine testing other than their mammograms and a good physical exam. Talking to your breast cancer survivors about the importance and the efficacy of changing your diet to a plant-based diet, minimizing your red meat, and trying to get that 150 minutes of exercise in a week has been shown to increase to reduce your risk of recurrence and death. And then asking about medication compliance because they're not likely to bring it up to you and having that ability to address things, common side effects like the hot flashes and the achiness are super important. Okay, I'm gonna turn it over to Utah. And I think we're taking questions at the end. Thanks everyone. Can everyone see me and hear me? See the... Yes, we can. Yes? yes. Okay, perfect. Let me just start from the beginning here and make it bigger. Let me do this. Yes. From beginning. 
Why do I have this? Anyway, okay, now I don't want to <laughs> take more time. So I'm Jutta, I work with Dr. Beck in the oncology breast and gyne uh, patients. And thank you for letting me speak here. So my phase was talking about survivorship of breast cancer uh, patients and, uh, below the waist. And here, so my, and second, <laughs> how do I, sorry for this. I want to do the slideshow. Get rid of this. Go ahead and hit re resume slideshow. Little gray box right there towards the top of the screen. Yeah. I yeah, can it. find it. Huh. Right, right above the word uh, breast cancer. Yep, resume okay. slideshow. So that maybe that's now better. Okay. But it looks good. So what I want to bring over is um, that you think about the sexual health implications of breast cancer survivors um, and what is the scope of this. And then, uh, then again, uh, just going a little bit more deeper into the possibilities of how to treat vaginal dryness and atrophy, and then uh, shortly check about bone health. So what is the scope of the problem of sexual health? So as you can imagine, all what we do to treat the breast cancers, uh, we can affect their body image, we can affect their sens skin sensitivity, we suppress their ovaries and we use hormonal therapy. I don't know why this goes automatically. <laughs> okay, let me go back here, all right. So, um, and I think what is really important is to see that sexual health problems don't go away by themselves and they can even worse, worsen if you never address them. So, no, sorry. <laughs> okay, so in a big study in France, they, did, they asked all cancer survivors about five years after their diagnostic, what is the implication on your sexual health? And as you can see here, about 56% 6, of uh, people answered that there's a moderate to severe impact on their sexual health. And in, in, a, in another study, premenopausal breast cancer survivors were asked about uh, what they respond, is that they have at least in two sexual function problems and over 50%. And as you can see, this doesn't go away Five years after the breast cancer diagnosis, almost 30% of them had still sexual health dysfunction. And after 10 years, 20%. So I think we, we need to address this. And unfortunately, people feel like they can't ask the provider. They feel embarrassed. They feel the provider will dismiss their concerns. And only six to 10% of women felt, oh yeah, I was asked. And then a study showed that from primary care providers, self-reported questionnaires showed that only 60 or that 62% said, I rarely address sexual health in cancer survivors. So I think we have a huge gap of need and address. And this is not, a, a not a surprising because sexual health is such a complex personal, physi physiological, interpersonal, social and cultural aspect. So we need to ask a multidisciplinary team to approach this. And we, we have here now a sexual health clinic at Huntsman and I urge you to, if you didn't hear about us, there's a website coming up too. So, and I think what we need to know as well is that not one person can address all these problems, but you're not alone. There are many other people who can address this. But what is important is that we talk about it. So one stake of all the therapies is sexual health education and communication. So, and this is what I want to take over here is to, to tell you how important it is just to ask the question, do you have any sexual health problems after your breast cancer diagnosis? So now I change gears and we concentrate on the vagina, on the changes that lack of estrogen brings to it. And as I think this picture shows it very nicely how drastic this effect is, the lack of estrogen. And people under hormonal treatment with aromatase inhibitors or tamoxifen, they can feel this even more. 
So it is important to address this. And for we have a lot of different um, non-hormonal treatment for uh, vaginal atrophy. We have the lubricants, we have the moisturizers. And I think one completely underused stake is that you have physical therapy, which can increase your control of the pelvic floor, more relaxation possibilities, increase the blood flow to the pelvic floor. And then we have vaginal dilator therapy, which can massage painful areas, increase the elasticity of the vagina, and lead to more, maybe if possibly, relaxation training by using the, di uh, the dilator. And then we could numb the area as well. So these are safe possibilities. And then we, um, the FDA approved CO2 laser treatment. And the principle of this treatment is to cause little microabrasions in the vaginal mucosa to increase blood flow, to increase uh, repair mechanism, and to increase the collagen. And you usually need about three to four treatments for initial treatment. And then they are repeated every four to six weeks. And the maintenance should be about once a year. Um, the problem is, and um, the data showed that it's better than placebo, and it's about comparable to estrogen, local estrogen therapy. But we have a paucity of long-term data and security there. And the most important factor, I think, is that it is usually not covered by insurance and it has a high price tag. So, yeah, so now this would be all our possibilities for non-hormonal treatment. The more, so hormonal treatment, um, usually the studies showed that you never reach levels above the postmenopausal levels of estrogen when you use local estrogen. And it did not increase the risk of endometrial or breast cancer for normal postmenopausal women. Fortunately, for breast cancer survivors, we do not know the safe estrogen level. And with an atrophic vagina, you have higher absorption rates of these medications you use. Um, but nevertheless, studies showed consequently that uh, in breast cancer survivors, local therapy did not increase the risk of, breast, of, of recurrence. So what do we use there? We have a very low um, estradiol gel preparation of four micrograms. And I don't know, I hope you all know about the, the E-string. This can remain there for three months. You can, um, the patients can take it out in and out like they want. And then we usually recommend tablets, which are easier to dose than the creams. And in the beginning, you should treat the atrophy accordingly. Not saying, oh, take it once a week. This is not enough in the beginning, even if we have the higher absorption rate in the atrophy. But it's important to have at least a time frame where it can really work on a daily basis, and then you can reduce to twice weekly. So, um, the ones on aromatase inhibitor. So there the goal is really to reduce any estrogen in your body because otherwise you counteract a little bit the effect of the aromatase inhibitors. But there are DHEA preparation, vaginal preparations you can use. And they showed that even, uh, especially under the treatment of aromatase inhibitors, they do not increase the estrogen levels. So, and this is called prosterone or infrarosa, and this is uh, put in daily. So I think I just mentioned it here because I think many people come with this. Oh, I heard testosterone would help me. It does. It has a lot of receptors in the vagina, but I think we do not have enough studies to have a safe saying that this is recommended in breast cancer survivors. So therefore, local testosterone is not recommended for, for breast cancer. Um, so many people, you might see people long time after their breast cancer diagnosis coming to you with bothersome postmenopausal symptoms. So should they go on a systemic HRT, so hormone replacement therapy, yes or no? And of course, you need to bear in mind what kind of breast cancer they had. But there was a huge study in, in Sweden, the Habits trial, 
And this was early to um, stop because the recurrence rate of breast cancer was much higher in the HRT group in uh, comparison to the placebo group. And the Stockholm trial was terminated then as well, although they had better results. But nevertheless, we do not have any data to really recommend systemic HRT after uh, the breast cancer diagnosis. There's one, maybe there can be one exclusion to this. This is ospamifene, which is a selective estrogen receptor modulator. And in preclinical studies, it showed it has an anti estrophic effect on breast cells, but it's too early to judge it for real uh, HRT or systemic treatment for vaginal atrophy for, at this point. So summary, first you should always try the non-hormonal uh, uh, treatments for vaginal atrophy. And I think it is important to see where does, uh, what kind of breast cancer they had. Of course, if the hormone receptor negative, you might not do any harm to give some more hormones. But if they have a high rec a cancer recurrence rate and then you need to take into addition the apart the amount of the symptoms and the suffering of the patients. So I think it is important to, um, to know that you, even if you take local estrogen, the risk of recurrence under anti-estrogen therapy was not found. And we usually would recommend with tamoxifen treatment, you block the estrogen receptor so you can give local estrogen with an aromatase inhibitor, we would prefer the DHEA vaginal inserts and no systemic hormonal receptor therapy or, or local testosterone for breast cancer survivors. So quickly, I, I'm running out of my time and I'm sorry that we went over time. Um, I think we all know that estrogens are really, really important for the bone health in women. And taking it away with our therapy, either hormonal therapy or the early premature ovarian suppression with chemotherapy, or uh, we can make bone loss worse and bone fracture risk higher. So in tamoxifen, it has a protective effect on postmenopausal women for their bone health, but not in premenopausal women. And so I think it is recommended to do DEXA scans there if there's long-term tamoxifen therapy in premenopausal women as well. So this is just an overview of the Endocrine Society about how to treat, uh, sorry, and I'm running out anyway. So you can look at this in, in, at your leisure. I think in the treatment areas we are, we are for breast cancer survivors, we need to use the bone modifying drug therapy or the anabolic drug therapy um, in order to improve their bone health. And there are some disadvantages of the denuzumab. It has a slightly lower risk profile, side effect profile, uh, but it has the disadvantage of causing some rebound once you stop the treatment. So there, all what they gained over years can get lost. And usually it is recommended to um, follow up on this with biphosphonates. So again, this is my summary. And here are some helpful websites you can use if you're more interested in, in more detail. And I'm always available. If you have any questions, you can email or call me. And we have a, health, a sexual health clinic here at home. So now we can open the discussion if anything anybody has left is left over. Thank you very much for your attention. Nita, that was awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you, very helpful lecture. Appreciate it. Does anyone have any questions they wanna ask or anything come up in the chat that we wanna address? I know probably a lot of people had to leave because we did go over. There was just a lot of things to cover. over in Grand Junction. And I just had a question about, um, Dr. Beck, you mentioned you don't routinely recommend um, calcium supplementation. I guess um, I was, I had a question about, is that different if, if it's a patient on an AI or a medication that can um, reduce or reduce bone density over time? 
No, it actually isn't. And that's because calcium supplementation really hasn't been shown to be that much of a factor in the treatment or prevention of osteoporosis or osteopenia. And because we're seeing the calcification or abnormal calcification is a problem for women, um, I, if they, have, if they eat, eat meat, I just have them take maybe one calcium pill a day. But otherwise, I, I, if they're, I, I just don't promote a lot of it. And I certainly wouldn't have them take calcium without a vitamin D. For their bones, the biggest thing that's gonna make a factor is weight bearing or jarring activity. So things like pickleball or hiking or snowshoeing or skiing or playing tennis, those are the things that will help build bone density and making sure that their vitamin D levels are intact. But calcium probably doesn't have much of a role at all anymore. Great, thank you so much. You bet.